Hi and welcome back to my channel. Um, I took a week off recording because I'm back to work and I need to organise myself and other things so please forgive me but I'm back. So as you know by now if you've been following me I am Tina Abena Ofariwa. I'm a teacher, poet and novelist living in London town and today's video I wanted to do something a little bit different. I want to pay homage to some of the authors and books which inspired me to write. So without further ado, let's get straight to it. First book on the menu is Norwegian Wood by the legend himself, Haruki Murakami. Now, Haruki Murakami has got to be one of my favorite authors of all time. And this book right here, Norwegian Wood, captures all the reasons why I put him on such a high pedestal. I love beautifully constructed literary texts, books that read like poetry almost, and I think that's exactly what Murakami does, well at least in all the novels I've read, which is a lot. <laughs> now as autumn and winter soon approach, there are certain books I believe that lend themselves to be read under the duvet or on the couch with a blanket and some hot chocolate. This is certainly one of those books. There's a huge focus on winter. It embodies death, loss and grief. Now, if you are someone who suffers from seasonal defective disorder, then I wouldn't recommend it. But I personally love to read kind of dark, deep books which force me to ponder on life and death in autumn and winter and I tend to gravitate towards kind of uplifting books in spring and summer. But hey, different strokes for different folks. All right, so Murakami's books have become popular all over the world and he rose to popularity fairly quickly after he started writing in his homeland, Japan. This is the novel that propelled Murakami to fame. Well, it brings to light social issues which one cannot escape when in Japan, that is death by suicide. Not to say that this isn't a universal problem, but in Japan, suicide is a major social and national issue. It confronts also the universal themes of grief and mourning, how we cope, or more aptly, how we are unable to cope sometimes, and how this in turn can manifest sometimes in really damaging ways. So much so that when we are presented with an opportunity to be happy and have a fresh start, we don't always immediately gravitate towards the positive. Sometimes our grief can come to consume or define us. With all that being said, this book is not for the faint-hearted. It is extremely dark and gloomy, but Murakami is a master of words. The way that he writes keeps you so engrossed and so addicted that even when it does get really dark and gloomy and you think there is no way you can possibly go on reading, you still can't stop yourself. The way he weaves words together, for me, I think is simply magical. Now, Murakami is known for his mystical, surrealist, fantastical stories with giant six feet tall talking frogs and talking cats and all sorts, to which he says, and I quote, People say my books are weird, but beyond the weirdness, there should be a better world. It is just that we have to experience the weirdness before we get to the better world. That's the fundamental structure of my stories. You have to go through the darkness, through the underground, before you get to the light. And I just thought it's, it's just really beautiful, and I think it's just so precise in its reflection of, of life, really. So in this text, kind of absent of his signature surrealist style, um, the book is still very magical. And without giving too much away, and I'll just tell you a little bit about the premise. Um, it's about Toru, a young man who's left broken after the death of his childhood best friend, Kizuki, who committed suicide. He falls in love with Kizuki's girlfriend, Naoko, who is likewise devastated by the suicide. She's mentally unwell and ends up in hospital. During that time, Toru meets someone else, Midori, and falls in love. Pretty straightforward plot, but Murakami unearths kind of a range of emotions which truly showcase the complexities of life and the struggle to move on after experiencing a tragedy. I never fail to be impressed by the way Murakami captures moods and feelings so precisely. He gives words to the feelings you cannot voice or aptly articulate. As one reviewer said on Goodreads, um, the mundane details of everyday life is spun into a dreamy tapestry. And I think this is so precisely why I love him so much. <laughs> okay, so moving on to the second book, um, Shanghai Baby. 
Now, when I think of Shanghai Baby, the first question that pops into my head is, what's a novel that you like that everybody else seems to hate? Well, for me, it's got to be this text, Shanghai Baby by Zhu Wei Hui. I hope I've pronounced her name correctly. I'm sure I haven't, but okay. I bought this book when I was 16 or 17 in Japan in a bookshop in Nagoya in the JR Towers. For those of you who are familiar with Nagoya, I was just browsing the bookshelves, not looking for anything in particular, but this book caught my attention. I read the blurb and first few pages and thought, yep, yeah, I'll give that a go. <laughs> like I said about Haruki Murakami's work being kind of poetic and lyrical writing, I really felt the same way reading Shanghai Baby. I just thought it was really incredibly well written. Now about the book, it was published in 1999. 40,000 copies of Shanghai Baby were burned by the Chinese government for its risque and decadent depiction of China. Um, this actually helped to propel it to further success as it garnered even more interest and subsequently sold in over 19 countries. Yes, the protagonist Coco is extremely self-obsessed and overly confident in her looks and feminine prowess. Everybody is in awe of her writing a novel, all of which is part of her ambition, readying herself, and I quote, to burst upon the city like fireworks. Many of the negative reviews are based on this kind of narcissistic element, but in the grand scheme of things, I don't think this is a bad thing. I mean, it's told from a first person narrative and her experience being kind of a modern woman living in modern China. As I mentioned, I first read the book in Japan many moons ago and actually this book became very popular in Japan, which has over, I think, 200,000 copies alone. Now, I knew back then, even being, you know, being as young as I was, that Japan and China differed wildly, economically, politically, and I assumed socially. And although Japan is not a repressive society, I did find that Japanese women were quite conservative and demure in many ways. There is an expectation out there of how women should be, which is stressful. Um, certainly that image that's forever ingrained in our Western minds of Harajuku style girls and Lolita fashion, all of which has come to define our perception of Japanese women and girls, we forget is just a subculture. The reality across Japan is very different. But with that being said, there are women who go against societal expectations to be so conservative and modest in their mannerisms, and reading this novel at that time, around 2006, 2007, was refreshing. Coco's look at me attitude at that time reminded me of the few girls around me who were living life on the edge. They were boisterous and outrageous with their style. They were also in some very compromising relationships with foreign men, sort of similar to what the protagonist in Shanghai Baby experiences. So perhaps reading this, for me, there were lots of themes which felt familiar. And it was brilliant to see a young Chinese woman so liberated in her approach to her life and her sexuality. I myself was just beginning to explore Japan's nightlife and at the centre of this novel is the lives of young people in their mid-twenties whose lives really revolve around Shanghai's urban night scene, meeting models, various artists and hanging out with old madams who've acquired wealth and celebrity status off the back of deceased older husbands. It was intriguing. As a Western woman with preconceived notions, or more aptly, ignorance with regards to modern China and its culture, this definitely fascinated me and reminded me that despite the extents governments go to control and restrict people's liberty and police women's sexuality, you will always find pockets of people pushing back. And young people in Shanghai, as presented by Wei Hui, are just as daring in China as they are in the UK or the US. So yes, I can understand that for a Western audience, her recount of drug-filled parties and an affair with a married German man may not seem all that enthralling or make for an interesting read because it's such a normalized aspect of Western culture, but at least it's a narration of young people so consumed with their own lives and you know who seem to exist in a bubble getting up to all sorts should at least be related Relatable. As a woman, I was drawn to Coco's cool confidence. She's no damsel in distress, she's not looking for anyone to save her, she's full of ambition and oozes sex appeal and the men in her life seem to orbit around her. She's clearly very powerful and I'm surprised at negative reviews touting that she's so self-centered and thinks she's the sexiest blah 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 blah. It's like what Chimamanda Adichie says, 
we teach girls to shrink themselves, to make themselves smaller. We say to girls, you can have ambition, but not too much. You should aim to be successful, but not too successful. You can be sexy, but not in your face sexy. Yes, we like powerful women and want more of them, only we want them to be not so brazen in their manner. And I think this is rather backwards. I love Coco. I have been Coco. I know girls like Coco. And I think this is indeed a story about self-discovery. And I thought the plot and writing was simply beautiful. I enjoyed being toured through Shanghai City. It was really brought to life for me and it made me want to visit. I think Wei Hui did well to bring together the similarities between the East and West by her constant reference to Western literature, particularly by Henry Miller, whom the writer is clearly enamored with and whom I've also fallen in love with over the years. So I would definitely recommend this book, despite all the negative reviews. I think it's a lovely insight into a part of modern Shanghai, which as a Western audience, we don't really know or think very much about. So yeah, that's it. Anyway, I hope you've enjoyed this video. Um, I'm an avid reader and I particularly love novels set in unique places, which is part of the reason why I set my first novel, Wildflower, in Japan. So I'll be doing lots more reviews and book recommendations. So stay tuned. Don't forget to leave a comment, like and subscribe and all that good stuff. Until next time, have a great week. Take care. Bye.